everyone. My name is Peter Zhang, and I'm a Chief Resident of Internal Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. I want to start off by thanking everyone for here for listening to my talk today. Can everyone see the presentation and hear me? Okay. This presentation yes. can also be accessed via this QR code here, as well as the bottom left corner of the later slides. I've uploaded some uh, additional supplemental information to there as well. My project is remote monitoring of patients with congestive heart failure in rural areas reduces admissions over time. The learning objectives are to understand the burden of congestive heart failure or CHF on the healthcare system and challenges that rural healthcare systems face. Second, to identify socioeconomic factors that may affect outcomes in CHF patients. And last, discuss features of a successful heart failure monitoring program. First, some context for the study. CHF is one of the most common and expensive chronic diseases in the United States. By 2030, CHF is projected to affect 8 million adults and cost the country over $69 billion. The majority of costs are associated with hospitalizations and over 1.25 million patients were discharged with CHF in 2018. Since the pandemic, telemedicine and remote monitoring have become more popular methods to treat patients outside the hospital and cover larger geographic areas. Recently, CHF monitoring has been on the rise with studies demonstrating decreased mortality and hospital readmission rates. However, most of these studies use expensive and often invasive devices such as implanted pulmonary artery pressure monitors. Because of the expenses and the expertise needed, some of these studies are largely performed at major academic institutions and urban settings that may be hard to implement in smaller community-based hospital systems with more limited resources. West Tennessee Healthcare is located in Jackson between Memphis and Nashville, <clears throat> excuse me, Nashville. It serves as a regional hospital for a predominantly rural community. According to the Healthcare Resources and Services Administration, every county surrounding Jackson is a designated healthcare professional shortage area with a measured shortage of primary care providers. The circle on the map here shows Jackson. Counties in green are all designated as rural, which can be seen basically all around Jackson. Now, why do these healthcare professional shortage areas matter? Well, they affect National Healthcare Service Corps and Nurse Corps assignments, as well as Medicare reimbursement of rural health clinics and bonuses. It's also a standardized method to see which counties have a shortage of providers. As such, we believe a cost-effective monitoring program may be helpful for rural hospitals to decrease admissions and costs while delivering quality care to larger geographic areas. On the right here is a map that summarizes our study design. We use the best practice advisory in the EMR to recommend referrals for patients with an ejection fraction less than 50% from inpatient hospitals, uh, cardiology clinics, and primary care clinics. Any patient with at least one CHF mission in the last year was eligible. Once enrolled, we educated patients on CHF and the study and provided a scale for measuring home weight. Additional data were collected at baseline, including patient age, sex, race, highest education level, insurance type, home address, ejection fraction, estimated GFR, which measures renal function, the number of guideline-directed medical therapy medications, diuretic use, initial weight, and the number of prior all-cause and CHF hospital admissions before enrollment. Our remote monitoring team, consisting of about 20 nurses, called the patient several times a week in the first four weeks and then weekly thereafter. Patient weights and symptoms were collected, and based on our algorithm, if the patient gained significant weight or reported worsening of symptoms, the monitoring nurse notified the patient's PCP or cardiologist for urgent follow-up. Patients were enrolled with a goal of 12 months of monitoring, but today's presentation only covers data analyzed from the first three months. Fortunately, none of our patients dropped out or had any mortality events in the first three months. 47 patients were included in the study. Mean age was 61 years. 38% were female and 62% of our patients were male. 40% were black and 60% were white. Mean ejection fraction was 31% and mean compliance was 83%. You can view the full population characteristics and the supplement using the QR code in the corner. Hospital admissions were the primary outcome. These patients accounted for 47 all-cause admissions and 25 CHF-related admissions in the three months prior to enrollment. Causation was determined via chart review by a nurse or physician. In the three months following monitoring, these patients accounted for only 15 all-cause admissions and four CHF admissions, a drop of about 65 and 85% respectively. Mean weight was measured as a secondary outcome and decreased from 213.9 to 207 pounds, or about a 3% drop. P-value was significant at 0.01. Additionally, other variables were analyzed using percent weight change, we found that race, distance of the hospital, diuretic use, and the number of guideline-directed medical therapy medications that patients took all affected percent weight change with significant p-values. Those variables are in bold on the table on the right. 
the remaining variables do not affect weight change significantly. Here I plotted the average patient weight over 12 weeks. There seems to be a consistent decline in the first eight weeks followed by some variance in the following four weeks. On the right is a graph that compares admissions before and after monitoring. As you can see, there's a fairly dramatic decrease in both all costs and CHF admissions. Again, we saw about a 65 and an 85% reduction in both. Tying back to the introduction, 91% of our patients in the study resided in 14 counties designated as rural healthcare professional shortage areas. After monitoring, we saw a significant reduction in hospital admissions, which was our primary outcome. We use weight as a secondary outcome due to the importance of weight in both monitoring and treatment. Daily weight is often assessed as a surrogate for volume status and response to diuretics in the hospital setting. Weight is also a key aspect of heart failure education, and patients are often instructed to record daily weights and use trends as guides to take additional diuretics or alert their doctors. One previous study found that weight gain of more than two pounds in a week increased the odds ratio for admission for CHF patients. Our monitoring team serves as a check system to both identify weight increases and notify providers when appropriate. For significant variables, patients who took diuretics lost more weight compared to those who did not, which is expected, as that is the function of the medication. Similarly, patients taking more guideline-directed medications lost more weight. Black patients lost more weight compared to white patients. Previous studies have demonstrated that Black patients may have a greater response to diuretics due to a possible interaction in the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis which manages the amount of water in the human body. One interesting result is that patients who live closer to the hospital also experience more weight loss. There's no clear explanation for this, but patients who live further away may feel more burdened to seek care or miss more appointments. Further investigation into no-show rates and utilization of care may shed some light. Compliance was 83% in the study. In previous studies, higher compliance was theorized to improve mortality. We believe that two factors in our study improved compliance. First, we shifted the burden of reporting away from the patients to the monitoring team in order to make the study as convenient as possible for the patients. Additionally, patients may be more responsive to monitoring when speaking with another human being rather than interacting with automated systems. On top of that, since the patients were speaking with nurses, they could ask health care related questions directly. Previously, the largest CHF remote monitoring study did not find any improvement in mortality or readmissions, but they used an automated phone reporting system the compliance toward the end of the study was around 55%. What are some limitations of the study? This study was restricted to a single rural hospital system with a small sample size and duration. Additionally, while we alerted clinicians to high-risk patients with significant weight or symptom changes, we did not track any intervention outside of hospitalization. Therefore, we don't know if, if a patient saw a physician or went to the emergency department during the monitoring process. The most important factor to improve our study is time. As of this month, our first cohort of patients are approaching the 12-month endpoint. We are continuing to enroll patients on a rolling basis to increase the sample size and the power of the study. We are also working on comparing admissions in a similar time frame to an unmonitored cohort of CHF patients to give statistical significance to the decrease of CHF admissions. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I want to defer back to the moderator for any questions. Ready, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, so I do have a question. So uh, it looks like the primary outcome is to decrease hospitalizations for CHF ex exacerbation. Um, are you also looking into uh, to see if, whether these patients live any longer uh, as a measurement as well? Yes, it's uh, primarily we're looking at admissions, but we are, we are also tracking mortality because that's very important for these studies. Um, the fact is that we didn't have any mortality events in the three months, but as I've looked at data from longer than that, and we do have mortality events. So that is something that as we continue to finish monitoring or get, collect more data, we can report that as well. Mm -hmm. And are the, you think in the people that are, that are uh, more adherent to, uh, to taking the Lasix are also more adherent to taking other, uh, life prolonging medications? Yes, there's definitely a, uh, should there be a correlation between that because people take any medication should take all their medications. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, Lasix is one of those medications where if you take it, you definitely feel improvement pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. So we do have some patients out there, even in my personal experience, who may just take medications that they feel like are working and not take other ones. So it is kind of hard to say if those two are directly related, but there probably is a relation there. Mm -hmm.